because with the middleman you have no idea where their shady business is and what they're doing with people within the industry it is a really dark industry Rajan. welcome to the global indian podcast the world's greatest journey and the official platform for people of indian origin because let's face it we are everywhere welcome back to the voice this is season two episode two of a two-part special with an incredible individual, Hajra Khan. This podcast is jointly hosted by a global Indian ambassador in South Africa, Rajesh Gopi, and has been supported by our dear friends at ShareMe.com, the app for all your beauty, fitness, and wellness needs. As you know, my name is Rajan Nazran, and I explore. For over a decade, I've traveled the globe, piecing together the kaleidoscope that is our community. I've been held hostage, faced Ebola, and met extraordinary individuals, often in destinations that would surprise you. In this season, I'm joined by my dear friends around the globe as we take you on a voyage for the ears, as we plunge into the human experience of being a person of Indian origin, take a closer look at the countries we now call home, and tackle the big issues that we need to know. This two-part special is a conversation with an incredible individual whose own life is a living encyclopedia of inner strength and fighting for what's right. It's also a very candid discussion that delves into the sides of the entertainment industry that we often overlook. From nepotism, casting couch, the Me Too moment, to the impacts of social media and trolling. Without a shadow of a doubt, Hajra pulls no punches in this two-part special. As always, you can find out more about the Global Indian series at the end of the podcast. Now, quick word of note. If you listen to this via Podbean, make sure you subscribe so you do not miss part two. And if via YouTube, ensure you like and subscribe to our channel, the Global Indian series, to ensure you keep up to date with all our latest podcasts and you can also browse through all the stories so far. I really hope you enjoy this session. And just move. Get up and just move. Get up and just move. Get up and just move. So I was born in Quetta, Pakistan, which is a town very close to the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. It's a very regressive, it's a very conservative small town, predominantly very uh, Pathan-oriented, Pashtun, uh, which is which is the Indo-Persian uh, belt of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and I grew up with a lot of Afghan refugees. Grew up post Afghan war, so Pakistan had already changed a lot. It had already become very regressive. It had already was dealing with an influx of refugees, especially where I come from. So, um, growing up, I mean, poverty was something you saw, um, you know, I mean, I know we come from the countries that we come from and it's not nothing, it's not that it exists exclusively in some parts, it's just worse in some parts as opposed to others and Quetta, unfortunately, is one of those towns. Um, so coming from there, my father, God bless him, he just recently passed away. He was very liberal, he was very progressive, he was very empowered, so education was something that was a big instrument for us to get to where we wanted to, wherever we wanted to, to go abroad and, you know, uh, he, he encouraged us to do all of those things and I did. Uh, but film is something I was passionate about, storytelling, acting and all of those things. I never thought I could be an actress. I, I mean, even, even growing up, Pakistan did not have an industry. It's not like Bollywood, it's not Hollywood. We didn't, we had a small, very, what do you call regional cinema, Punjabi films. When I was growing up, hmm. you know, the Pakistani mainstream cinema had already started to die down. So, you know, it wasn't really an, a realistic goal or even a goal at all to think that something that doesn't exist, how could you be something, you know, it was just a fantasy. So here we are. And then things changed when I came back from Dublin from uh, my college and you know, some people discovered me and I was like, yeah, me might as well do this. I just wanted to make my own money rather than more than anything else at the time and play with it and then say, oh, maybe I'll go back to the West and got into it. And then fast forward, obviously, I think when we spoke, you grew up in this area that you said it's not conservative as stuff, but it's regressive. So you have these dreams of becoming an actress and now you're a celebrated actress on the TV screens in Pakistan. 
is it everything that you had hoped it to be? No, not at all, actually, far from it. When I started, I was very hopeful. I was very hopeful that the industry going to, is going to be very progressive, uh, that we will have an independent form of philosophy of filmmaking, like, like, the, like Iran does, maybe? Yeah. Not the same brand, but something that would be independent and something that would, you know, incarnate in something of its own. But that has not happened. In, industry still seems to be struggling struggling on many fronts, on money, on the lobby system, uh, um, on it, the confusion with social media, not to, not, to, not to be able to separate celebrity from craft. I don't know how, I'm sure Rajesh understands what I'm talking about here. You know how there's yeah, a big divide yeah, yeah, between yeah. the Netflix actor, the theater actor, and the mainstream actor. And now we have this new concept that's called people who are popular on Instagram. How many followers do people have? How, how, how is that relevant? I mean, that really takes a lot away from, uh, from the craft of acting. I think if you're an actor, you're an actor. I mean, you're, of course, you could be much more popular and you can draw more people to the, uh, to the theaters if you're a Tom Cruise or a Leonardo DiCaprio because you, you have that following, of course. I mean, that's worldwide, but uh, it's very disappointing, uh, I think. Uh, seeing Pakistan, I thought we would make more films that would be more organic, more real, as opposed to just doing hijacking issues and thinking they'd be popular on the um, festival um, circuit. It's either yeah. that or mainstream cheap copies of cheap Bollywood films. Yeah. There's no in between. There's no in between, Rajan. You know, we haven't even made it to Netflix, yes, because I've, I've seen the documents myself. Netflix finds our production values and all uh, very um, compromised and not up to their mark. So it's sad, but you still see people struggling, people trying to do, but most people, Rajan, you know, it's all about making money now. And that's what people are doing. Because people see the lifestyle. They see the lifestyle of actors like yourself, Rajesh. They think, wow, well, it must be all glitz, glamour, glory. But then I know, Ajara, you did a, uh, you did your own talk only a while ago where you actually kind of exposed that it's not that, that there is a very dark side. That there's a way that people are treated or the way that people almost perceive you to be. Now, so I suppose the question is, what's it like being you as a female actress that's a person of the land? You know, you grew up in this remarkable place towards the borders, in a place that is incredibly regressive as you term it to be. You make it on TV and now all of a sudden you see this rise of trolling, the rise of hate, but also the rise of the way that women are ill-treated within the industry. Yeah. You know, the thing with me is I'm not somebody, I, I always say this to other people, for me, the end goal was not being validated by millions for the glitz and the glam. That's a byproduct of it anyways. I mean, for most people, that is the actual goal to become an actor, to be adulated by millions, to be celebrated to be, you know, like as narcissist as you can get about it. It's all about the money. It's all about the fame. It's all about how popular you are. For me, that was never the goal because I was always really cool with myself. Even if, if, I'm, if I'm one of those people, if I had to perform in an empty theater, I'd be really okay with it that I did my job and that was my job. And same thing, I would have the same attitude towards if I was part of a blockbuster, I'd be very nervous. Of course, it's, it's just so huge and overwhelming. But it would still be me. Do you know what I mean, Rajan and Rajesh, when I say that? You have to be so okay with yourself as an actor to say, and for most people, the goal is the millions on the Instagram, the clothes, the, all that validation that you get from, from the outside. So that is something always made me nervous. It's like that's not, and, and the means to that could be very dark. It was whatever you can do to get there, and that whatever could be a million and one things that you have to compromise yourself. And many people do because it's, it's competitive, it's cutthroat, and you have so many things happening nowadays. And to be there, to be on par with all of the things, I mean, this is why people get so depressed um, if their films are not doing. I think Sushant's suicide was such a rude awakening for so many actors across the world. It's like, so what is it all about? Why do entertainer, entertainers suffer from depression so much more than the normal person? You'd think they have it all. 
but it's just the price you pay and you have to pay. And then there's the lobbies and then there's the, the uh, corporate culture that comes in with their own agenda. And then there's the producers and then there's the mob that is within the underground, you know, the underbelly of it. The, the middlemen, I've always said the middlemen are far more scarier than the people on top. Because with the middlemen, you have no idea where their shady business is and what they're doing with people within the industry. It is a really dark industry, Raj, and it's not obvious and grand slam, and nobody wants to talk about. May I ask you a question about? You talk about the dark industry. Dark industry. I mean, it's a well-known fact that in Bollywood, for example, that the mob or the underworld have funded actors, have pushed actors, uh, even pushed their sons and daughters sometimes to become actors. Um, yeah. is, that the, is that what you're referring to? Is that you're saying that? Uh, no, 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 not at all. With here, that would not be that rampant, I think. Not mm -hmm. with here. We do, here, we don't hear that kind of stuff. Because it's not that big, you see, Rajesh. Ours is very small. It's only just sort of crawling and uh, trying to find its way right. from the, the TV media. And the money isn't as large as, as big. Right. And the okay. marketing isn't there. It's not that big. It's not that competitive. It's not that cutthroat. It's still like a tiny little butt there, which is just striving to be to get to where that is. But, but the exploitation is there. Well, that would be there because cultures are not that different. The cultures are not that different in terms of how you do business. Right. So you do have people coming. Like you have a lot of people that I see who make films. They have these uh, investors, the silent partners, who just right. bring in the money and they make these films and the films don't do well. And then these people, uh, you know, they're complaining about, well, we invested our money into these people, we trusted them. We thought they were selling us like the next Tarantino coming up and that doesn't happen. So you see that happening a lot here. A lot of- uh, How dark is dark? I suppose that's the question that I'd be asking. I'm not as fortunate to be in the acting world as your guys' profession. So when you're telling me that it's dark, I'm kind of thinking, well, what? what are we discussing here? I think with us, I say this, I mean, we might be not having got as dark as if you go to Hollywood, then there's things and there's been leaks. And fo I mean, there was an Angelina Jolie interview that was so scary. Her experiences initially with all the, um, you know, the underground, the little groups, the little cults and uh, the producers the directors and all of those things that they talked about and i thought that was far more scarier than i have gone through in my career so then you realize and you start questioning yourself so how dark is dark here you get a few sleazy directors and producers texting you on whatsapp and the next day the project is off the table and you are nowhere in the project you don't hear back but that's because what they're expecting something in order for you to be on that project do, a, lot of, a lot of men you know uh after, after the Harvey Weinstein uh, blow up, yeah, a lot of people were shaken up by the whole Me Too thing and all of actresses and all wanted things to change in terms of being paid equally, in terms of getting better roles. And most of all, not having their auditions done, uh, done in some hotel room after midnight. I've had a lot of those calls. I think and every actress goes through those. And then you think, well, we do have these orders. Yes, I should just finish at 10. Yes, it does. Maybe that is a norm. And then sometimes you, you start start to rationalize it. You may, maybe he means well, maybe he doesn't. And unfortunately, most of the time, they do not mean well. But then Rajan and Rajesh, we all know there's always somebody who's gonna grab that as an opportunity and get to that film that they wanted. Mm -hmm. There's always somebody who's going to will, be willing to put themselves out there and take that not as a harassment, but as an opportunity. There's those people as well. And that's why it makes it such a muddy ground to survive in. Like, okay, so there's this dark side from them for me to survive and make it. But then there's a dark side from my part of the industry as an actor for hire. And there's people willing to put out. There's people silently who would do this and are doing this. And it, it is far more common that you, than you would think that. Wow. There's always but, men in. Wow. So Rajesh, you're going to say something. Have you ever been in that position yourself in South Africa? I think here people are stronger. And I think here the, 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 the idea of what you can and can't do is, 
um, probably more regulated a little, you know, but there are a lot of women that have come forward after the Me Too scandal and exposed directors and producers, but it's not as rampant as I understand it to be in Bollywood or, or as Hajra is explaining now, because there is recourse for women here. And, and very quickly can a producer and director be uh, exposed. Uh, I'm not saying it's not happening, but it, it's not as rampant, it seems, from what I've heard. And um, here in South Africa. But then again, it's, it's, um, there are stories. There are stories. Also, one of the things that, uh, that's different here in South Africa is that we have a lot of women in the position of power where casting is concerned and not men. It's a huge difference. That makes a huge difference. Yeah. yeah. So here, the, the, all the major casting directors are women. Yeah. Of, of the that five I know, difference. all five are women. Um, and you have a lot of women working in film and television. So it does change the dynamic a lot. There are women directors, there are women producers, lots of women crew. So uh, I think that, uh, and also we've gone through a phase where a lot of the idea around sexuality, rape, exploitation has been highlighted a lot. And if someone pulls that kind of stunt, an actress can very quickly go to the newspaper and boom, that guy's gone. So you know? what, what and, do you think's made it different than in Pakistan then, Hajra? Is it the fact that you don't have the female voices within the industry? No, we don't. We don't. And uh, patriarchy is very strong on this one, on the system. You have a boys club. You have a lot of actors who go, go on and progress to be friends with producers or even end up being producers because it's really small. Rajan is such a small industry yeah. and people from television in the new wave of cinema that you see are the people who went from TV to films because you didn't have any movie stars. You had to create them. You had to bring mm -hmm. them to the cinema. So you took all the top uh, TV actors and you turned them into one or two movie stars. So with women, less and less women in the offices and the women who are in office, most of them are as patriarchal when it comes to writing for women, when it comes to ageism, when it comes to sexism, when it comes to money, and most of them classism. Like I, I'm on set, this, you know, the average schedule in Pakistan is a 12 hour shift. Can you imagine how draining it is for technicians without air conditioning, without proper leave, without proper holidays, who are in this heat, in those lights, working 12 hours a day, for peanuts, they're really taken advantage of in my industry. And it's really disheartening to see somebody work 12 hours a day in the excruciating conditions for, with minimum pay and absolutely no benefits, absolutely nothing. If somebody were to pass a set from an accident, that'll be it. It'll be just somebody who's dead. It'll just be somebody who doesn't show up the next day and I easily replaced. I suppose but the question no is, what qualifications does one need to have in order to become a technician? Is it a Nothing. job for everybody? They learn. These are these are handy men who learn on the job. The right. start many is, people, many people in film yeah, and TV come yeah. into it by hands-on. Yeah. Technicians? No, they're not trained technicians as such. These are just mm. very poor people who come in looking for a job and start as spots, and a being right. light men, and a being yeah. assistant, and a being all of those things. Mm -hmm. The industry is not an empowering industry. The people at the top have not empowered it. Just a few producers, they're rivals, they're not united to make sure that everybody is protected, be it actors. There's no laws for actors either that protects them. The producers have their own uh, little association. Where anybody, if I were to have, say, a sexual harassment case or something strong. And I went through, I didn't go through sexual harassment, I went through somebody who wasn't paying me back, a producer. And you're sitting in the room with all these men who were snickering and making these backhand jokes. And then you have you give them your number and all, just to make sure that they call you back and see how much, what they've done with the case. And all you get is, can we meet for coffee? Can we meet for dinner? Because you know they never took you seriously to begin with. Has that happened place. to you? This was me. 
it has happened to me. That's what I'm saying. This is something that happened to me six years ago when I was much younger, much younger, much more vulnerable. And then I gave up and then I thought I'm not going to, I'm not going to be part of this industry. And that's when I started writing. That's when I went abroad and I wrote and then now I'm a writer as well. And I just finished my film screenplay. So this is how you realize when you're sitting in this room full of all these men and you know, if somebody with the me too things change, people have only become a bit conscious as in they don't want their name to be outed. Not that there is any law out there to get them or not that there would be any boys who loud them. They just don't want the bad news or the bad smell of it. And it dies down because these guys, they have each other's backs. Yeah. I suppose one thing that we said in the phone that I thought was especially pertinent for the audience to hear was the fact that there's a lot of actors who have gone through it, but they'll sit in the fence. At times when there's almost warmongering that we saw quite recently between the tensions between India and Pakistan, you had some actors that were kind of calling out for it. But when there's real big issues such as discrimination, when there's inequality, the same voices are deafeningly quiet. Why is that? Why is it that yeah. all of us, why, why does that happen in your opinion? What a fantastic episode so far. I'm sure you agree. I promise you, Hajira pulls no punches. She didn't disappoint. An incredibly remarkable individual. So this is part one. You're probably wondering where is part two, where it's really easy to get hold of it. If you have been listening to this via Podbean, all you have to do is make sure you subscribe. Comment is always useful. And have a look for part two on there. If you have subscribed, it should load up automatically. If you listen to this via YouTube, again, super simple. Go for the playlist, Hajra Khan, or just go through the library and you'll see part two written there. In part two, Hajra goes even deeper into the life within the entertainment industry. And her and Rajesh also speak a bit more about the difficulties of social media and the way moving forward for aspiring actors and actresses. Now, if you like what we do, get involved. Reach out to us via Instagram. You can reach me directly via my personal Instagram, which is at the Nazrans or at the Global Indian Series. Obviously, you also have us on Facebook as well as YouTube. Here, you can tell us about your personal experiences, stories that you feel matter most and help shape the story and the voyage. Until you hear my voice again, I hope all remains well. The second part to this is absolutely incredible. Speak to you soon.